Some of them standing, some are waiting in line As if there was something that they thought they might find Taking some strength from the feelings that always were shared And in the background, the eyes that just stared What was it brought you out here in the dark? Was it your only way of making your mark? Did you get rid of all the voices in your head? Do you now miss them and the things that they said? At 7.35 a.m., a call came into the West Manchester Township Police Department. The caller reported a suspicious or disabled vehicle. West Manchester Township Police Sergeant Timothy Bolton proceeded to a location on Hoax Mill Road. Upon investigation of the abandoned vehicle, Sergeant Bolton found the body of a white female. In searching the interior of the car, he noticed blood on the side of the vehicle he found the car's registration, which identified the owners of the car as Jeffrey L. and Penny L. Gunnett. Sergeant Bolton summoned assistance to extricate the body from under the vehicle. The York County coroner arrived and pronounced the female under the car deceased. The most heartbreaking scene occurred at 8 o'clock a.m. when Penny's husband Jeffrey arrived at the scene after he had been informed by one of his co-workers that the car Penny drove to work was along Hoax Mill Road, possibly disabled. He arrived at the scene as Penny's body was being extricated from under the vehicle. He then had the grim task of identifying his wife's body. The couple had celebrated their 23rd wedding anniversary the previous July. Jeffrey was interviewed by police and a detective from the district attorney's office later that afternoon at the Gunnett home. He reported that Penny had left home between 6 and 6.10 a.m., which was her daily routine. 
Jeffrey stated they did not talk much in the morning, but he would always call her at work by 7.15 to make sure she made it to work safely. On the morning of February 2nd, Penny's boss answered the phone. Jeffrey asked to speak with Penny and was told Penny had not arrived at work. Jeffrey, beginning to grow concerned, asked if Penny had an early appointment or meeting. Penny's boss checked her calendar and said there was no indication of an appointment or meeting. Jeffrey remarked that he planned to drive his wife's route to work in case she was on the side of the road with car trouble. After driving the route and finding nothing, Jeffrey decided to go into his office, figuring his wife would most likely look for him there if she were in trouble. Once at the office, Jeffrey was informed by a coworker that he had possibly seen Penny's car disabled along Hoax Mill Road. From that point on, Jeffrey Gunnett's life would never be the same. Mark Spots headed to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Cumberland County, where he had once resided. Christina Nolan has found her way back to Altoona, has discarded June Olinger's jewelry, and has turned herself in. For the next two and a half hours, Spots would appear on camera with Betty Amstutz at a bank, a sporting goods store, and eventually at the Knights Inn in Carlisle, where he would eventually be arrested. Prior to all of this happening, Mark Spots found an old friend, Joel Molinato, and tried to sell him the gun, telling him that the gun was dropping them like flies. He also tried to sell Penny Gunnett's jewelry. Mark Spots created an MO for himself, that MO being choosing easy targets. Spots had made the comment, this from Christina Noland, that he was going to grab the next woman he saw, referring to Penny Gunnett. He knew what type of woman he wanted, one that would be easy to overpower and control. But why kill them? Spots didn't want to return to jail, true, but I believe there was a reason for the murders that runs much deeper than Spots not wanting to return to prison. Spots' victim, June Olinger, was 52. Penny Gunnett, 41. Both victims fell into Spots' mother's age bracket. Did Spots purposely seek out women around his mother's age? No. He was desperate, and when he saw a suitable victim, he seized the opportunity. 
Spots to this day holds a great deal of animosity toward his mother because of the alleged sexual abuse, drug use, and negligence. Well-deserved, possibly, but imagine the rage when it was fresh, and then having these women, either of which could have been his mother, and it becomes a very real possibility that Spots carried out on his victims the very act he could not on his true intended victim, his mother. But what of Betty Amstutz, the seven-year-old retired Lutheran deaconess? Spots made it a point to tell me several times during our visits that the sun rose and set around his grandmother. I feel the animosity he holds toward his mother pales in comparison to the animosity that he holds toward his grandmother. Spots knew what to expect from his mother. She was cruel, she was abusive, she tortured him, but she was consistent. Spots may have desperately wanted her love, but even at a young age knew he probably wouldn't get it. Spots' grandmother rescued Spots and his brother from their mother, then did the unthinkable. She showed them love, gave them a home, but then gave them back to their mother without a fight. This was perhaps the greatest betrayal of all. <laughs>